My name's John Groshans. I served 32 years in law enforcement. I started with New York City. I rolled over to Flower Park, where at one point they asked me to become a school resource officer. I was a police trainer. I was a field training officer, and then they asked me to become a school resource officer. And the conversation kind of went like this. If you want me in the schools locking these kids up, you got the wrong guy. I'm not doing that. And they said, no, we want you to help the kids and the families. And most of these programs were born from my relationships with the schools. I just didn't realize how far reaching it was going to be. I didn't realize where I would be speaking. It's been a pretty cool ride. Um, what you're going to see basically is my pre-prom. It's a little bit more than the pre-prom, as you'll see. Uh, schools that hire me, they hire me for, for different aspects sometimes. Uh, one school said they wanted more of the teen driving. One school said no drugs. One school said 25 minutes, that's all you get. And, and we adjust the program to what the schools are looking for. So we try to hit the high notes to get what's important. But for me, working with young adults, what I found, you give them the right information, they'll make the right decision. The problem is there's a lot of bad information out there. Uh, when, when we look at social media, and it's funny because you hear Facebook come up all the time. The truth of the matter is they, they haven't been on Facebook in seven years. Facebook doesn't exist in their world. It just doesn't. And where we miss is stuff like YouTube, which is prevalent in their world. YouTube is only second to Google in query searches per day. YouTube is the number one way that people listen to music now. YouTube, 500 hours are downloaded every single minute onto YouTube. In their world, YouTube has become an incredible medium that we've completely missed. Uh, one of their YouTube celebrities, their YouTube stars, just got her own late night talk show. Most of us didn't even know who she was. It's Lily Singh. It's called A Little Late with Lily. She came from the YouTube world. And from that, she now has a talk show. So what I do in the pre-prom, it's going to be for house parties, it's going to be for parents for tips, administrative schools, but basically this is for the students to watch some of the pitfalls, especially the pitfalls before getting ready for college. Understanding just because you got admitted doesn't mean they can't take that away from you. Understanding because you got that scholarship doesn't mean they can't take that away from you. You got to be responsible here. You got to watch what you're posting, what you're saying, what you're doing, and that's kind of what we get into. So responsible prom planning, this would be for the parents and the students together, while well, educating the kids. Also, what do you expect from them? Tell you what, they, what we expect from that night, and they'll tell you what they're going to do. Some schools have come up with really cool ideas for their pre-prom. Long Beach, is anyone here from Long Beach? You guys still raffle off a car every year? Long Beach, said the seniors sell raffles at the beginning of the year. And at their, their prom, you know, proms only attended 50%. 50% don't show up at all. At the end of the night, the school district rents out Dave and Buster's, and they take the school buses on, and they all go there. And at 4 in the morning, they raffle off a car that was purchased with all the chances they sold throughout the year, because every kid believes they're going to win that car. Before they can win, they have to blow into an intoxilizer. If it registers at all, they go to the next person. And then with the money that's left over, they buy iPads and computers, and they raffle off that stuff. It gets the kids involved who didn't go to the prom, and it keeps the prom pretty much alcohol-free, which is a trick in today's day and age. Prom safety tips talk open about all rules, communication, all very important. Um, if you're going to host the pre-prom or the post-prom, we're going to get into the social host law and what that means for you and what your responsibilities are in your house. Uh, I think one of the things we really stress at the pre-prom with the parents is that the post-prom, after it's over, the school district's out. It's not a school-sponsored event anymore. When you rent those buses and send them into Manhattan, it's not a school-sponsored event anymore. You're responsible. You wrote, you rented that bus. Something should happen on that bus. We had a sexual assault take place on a bus on the way back from Manhattan last year. And they called the school and they called the Fall Park Police. Sorry. It's not a school event and it didn't happen in Fall Park. It happened in New York City. You have to go to New York City Police and report that. The transportation. You know, it's very funny with our kids and these buses. We're going to go rent these 50-person buses, then we're going to try to sell out the whole thing to keep the cost down. That means we don't always know who's on that bus with us. So they're going to tell you have this contract, have everyone sign it, have everyone be responsible. That's not normally what happens. Only a couple parents sign it, and they become responsible for everything that happens on that bus in that limo. And we're going to see sometimes how that can go sideways real quick. Your limo driver, talk to him, bus driver. There's no drugs and alcohol permitted on this limousine. What do we find? It's the parents that are loading the bus and the limousine up with the alcohol before the night starts. That's where they're getting it from. It's a rite of passage. It's not a rite of passage. The world has changed. The laws have changed. 
This is a TLC sticker. We show the parents to make sure it's, it has it in Nassau County. But more important, talk to that bus driver. Talk to the limo driver. Make sure they don't smell like alcohol on their breath. Make sure that they're of sound mind when you're talking to them, and then set the rules with them right off the bat. The safety contract, this is from SAD. If you want to download it, not a bad idea to sit down. Again, part of that expectation is what do we expect from you? What do we expect the night to go? And if you have any problems, you can always call us. And we're going to get into Uber, Lyft, and the ride shares in a little bit because these are still people we don't know picking our kids up. When we deal with high school students, sorry, it's also about decision making. Decisions that they make when they're with their friends. Mom and dad aren't around anymore. The police aren't there. The teachers aren't there. They're making these decisions on their own. So through the course of every presentation, I'll go through some decision-making processes with them. And this one is about John. John is 16 years old. He lives uh, right outside of New Orleans. He's in a very big school district, very popular. Uh, he drives. You can drive in Louisiana at 16. He uh, plays sports. Very popular young man. Halfway through this year, his dad gets transferred to the farmlands of Louisiana. So John moves with his dad out there. He goes into his new school. The new school is a total of 25 kids. He makes 26. He's not being bullied or picked on, but he's certainly not being welcomed either. The first nice day of spring, this, the, this school has a rite of passage where these kids drive to this bridge. And all 26 go. Then they climb to about the six foot mark of the bridge from the outside, they jump in feet first, they go into water and they come back out and they swim away. And this happens a number of times with a number of kids. When John gets there, when he gets to that six foot mark, his peers, his classmates tell him to go higher. Does he do it? Of course he does it. We all want to fit in. We all want to belong. John now goes to nine feet when everyone else was at six feet. They now tell him to go higher again. John now goes to 12 feet when everyone else jumped in at 6 feet, and John jumps in feet first, sitting in front of a 9th, 10th, 11th grade, 12th grade class. I'll say, this is you at this creek. John goes underwater, but he doesn't come back up. One minute, two minutes, three minutes. So you ask them, what would you do if you were standing there? And the answer is the same. I would go in and help, or I would call 911. All 25 kids did do something. They all drove away. The first 911 phone call doesn't come in until 45 minutes later. Let's go back to the beginning of the story. Your best friend is at the six foot mark. Your classmates and peers are now telling them to go higher. What would you say to your friend? Well, don't go. Don't be a jerk. Don't listen to them. Don't go higher. You have to be a best friend to help somebody out in life. Can't you just help out a classmate or a peer? Can't you just get that, that text message at night, that, that social media post, and see him in the hallway the next day and say, is everything all right? I saw what you said. I got this great guidance counselor, this great principal, this great, I'll go with you. And if you can't do it on your own, I get that. You and your best friend can go over there and say, listen, we saw what you put on YouTube last night. And, and had somebody done that for that young lady, Amanda Todd, her whole story doesn't crash and burn the way it does. Responsibility, this is very interesting with our young adults who are driving. You get into that car, that van, that limo. And we had this in New Jersey about four years ago, where the, one of these buses going to Brom gets pulled over. The police come on the bus. In the back of the bus, there's a gun. Who gets arrested? Everybody. Everybody but the driver gets arrested. And that's what happened on that bus, and no one knew. The problem was they told tickets. They didn't know who everybody was. So it was somebody's guest who dumped the gun there. Does that happen with drugs, too? Yes. It happens. You, you know, there's this term recreational marijuana in, in, in a high school is killing us. It, it's, it's killing us. It's not recreational, it's illegal. You still can't have it, in, it's coming, but right now you can't. So when you get that, that smell of aroma of marijuana coming from a car, does, does marijuana have a very unique odor? Can a police officer testify they know there's marijuana coming from that car? Yes. And in their world, they may not see it, but in the police world, what happens? That brings those police right to probable cause. They don't need consent to search that car anymore. They're going to go search that car, just on smell alone. But that brings those police right to probable cause. They don't need consent to search that car anymore. They're going to go search that car, just on smell alone. Your prom rules, watch your property, uh, get your own drinks, 
Don't ever take a drink from someone you don't know. If you ask for a Coke and get a Sprite, don't drink it. You get up, go to the bathroom and dance, just go get another drink. But also a buddy system. If you're with your friend and your friend had three Cokes and starts slurring their speech and starts falling over, there was something else in that Coke, in that Sprite. It's up to you to go get them the help they need. The after prom. You know, I, I don't know your districts in, in mine, they used to all go to New Jersey and rent the hotel and everyone went down there. Listen, it's a parent's decision. But how do you get out of there if, if things start going south? How do you leave? Do you know when you can go? Don't ever be afraid to call 911 if you're in a situation where you feel unsafe and you can't get out of. And again, Uber and Lyfts, they definitely serve a purpose in something like this. If you need a place to go really quick and get out of there, who's going to be there? Well, how do you know if they're going to be there if they're all in New Jersey? Your kids can tell you whatever they want. Once they get to New Jersey, anyone could be there. And Uber, Lyft, I'm a big fan of them. My kids all went away to college. The Uber and Lyft was a, a tool for me to be able to sleep at night knowing if they were at a bar, if they were getting drunk, if a date went the wrong way, that they could get out of it. The thing is, it's still people they don't know picking them up. And there are rules with Uber and Lyft. The bottom right photo, that is Samantha Josephson from the University of South Carolina. She's out with her friends. She's standing out in front of the bar at night, has a phone in her hand. What is she waiting for? A ride share. Everyone knows it, including this creep in this car. And he pulls up, and Samantha jumps in that car. And that guy kills her. So at Uber and Lyft, here's some of the rules. You don't need to be outside. They're going to tell you when they're there. There's no reason to wait outside. When they get there, that driver identifies you by name. You never identify yourself first. John, yep, John. And then you're going to check that license plate. You're going to make sure that that's the car you're supposed to be in. The safest place in that car is behind that driver in the back seat. We never sit in the front seat. You get in that car behind that driver, your phone goes to your ear. They don't know if you're talking to someone or not. But most important, they have a ride share status. You can share that ride with somebody live and in real time so they know where you are. If it's a dormy, a friend, a brother, a sister, a cousin, your mother, somebody should know where you are live and in real time when you're using these ride shares. Prom and domestic incidents. How does domestic, domestic incidents ever fall into the prom world? You know, families always defined, since the time I was at the academy, um, related by blood, related by marriage, child in common. And the Nassau County changed the definition. And when Nassau does it, the villages follow suit. And they changed it to an intimate relationship. Intimate can mean 100 different things to 100 different people. But if that sergeant that pulls up decides that this is a family dispute, sometimes we're put into must-arrest situations where no one has a choice. They also said dating or currently dating falls under family, uh, the definition of a family. Is the problem a date? Well, if that person that shows up says it is, it could affect how things go that night, such as we get there, she says everything's fine. You know what, we, we had a little fight, no one got hurt or anything. I was trying to call 911. He grabbed the phone out of my hand, but everything's okay now. No, it's not. Interfere with a 911 phone call during a family dispute, that's a must arrest. That person's going to get arrested whether you want them arrested or not. And that's how domestic violence falls into your prom world. <clears throat> Our uh, teen driver program we do, it's an hour long. I break it down to very short clips for the prom. Um, I do let them hear a 911 phone call that was made. I don't have it right now. The videos weren't working for me. But uh, it's a car that's speeding, and they lose control. It hits a pole, it splits in half, but their friends watch the whole crash, and they call 911. And you listen to this 911 phone call, well, how they're describing what just happened. It's heartbreaking. But AAA, you know, you know, we always had this thing with driving, Memorial Day to Labor Day, the Deadly 100, Friday night, Saturday night, and, and AAA and, and Allstate went together, and they started redoing the stats on these teen crashes. And what they found was even worse than we thought. You have a driver, a teen driver less than one year experience, and you add three or more teens to that car. No drugs, no alcohol. That car is at a 51% chance of being involved in a fatal crash. Fatal. That's an incredibly high statistic. <clears throat> we get into texting and driving a little bit because everybody's on their phone all the time. We were just in, in Long Beach doing the driver's ed program. 
and the kids, the, the kids' homework assignment was to look around for the week in their car and see who they find on the cell phone when they're driving. Who'd they find? Their parents. It was their, that wasn't the idea of the program. They were supposed to be looking at the other people. What they caught was their parents were on the cell phones all the time. When, when you talk about texting and driving, no one's on the phone for an awfully long time. We're going to glance down at the full phone, three to five seconds. We're going to respond very quickly with an acronym. We're not going to write a whole paragraph. And that's what Liz Marks was doing. Liz was texting her mom back and forth, three to five seconds. And she'll tell you flat out, I did not have my eyes off the road for that long. But what she didn't see was the tow truck in front of her had stopped. And she rear the back of that tow truck, and the bed of the tow truck goes through the driver's side windshield and hits Liz Marks in the face. Liz in high school was very pretty. She also modeled. She had a lot of friends, a very popular young, young girl. And then after the crash, that's what she looks like now. Liz will tell you the 19 surgeries to put her face back together, they all hurt. But what hurt just as much, all her friends disappeared. Every single one of them. They didn't have time for me and all my problems. Every year, unfortunately, every prom season, it's coming up again. We're scheduling our proms. I'll do it with Wendy. I don't know where she went. And we will get these crashes that start as soon as the proms start down south and work their way up. Every year. No drugs, no alcohol. This was a Tesla, and they were running a little late, and she was speeding. Prom night, graduation night. This is where we get a lot of our uh, DWI crashes with our kids, because I think they're under the impression that's because it's prom or graduation, they're going to be cut some slack. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I will tell you this right here and right now. Nassau County is the worst place to be arrested and prosecuted for driving while intoxicated. There's no other place in the United States that's worse than right here. It's a long, torturous, drawn-out process, and it's all done on purpose. We have the lowest rate of recidivism in the whole United States. We have the lowest rate of people getting arrested a second time, because what they're going to tell you, I'm never going through that again. I will never go through that process again. This is one of these decision-making stories again, and this is absolutely true. If anyone knows who this is, just raise your hand. I'll move on. I'm not here to cause pain. No? We have, two, we have four 17-year-olds in this car, all friends. The owner of the car has a license. The passenger has a permit. The licensed driver turns to the kid with the permit and says, hey, you want to drive my car? Of course I want to drive your car. Every kid with a permit is going to say, I want to drive your car, and they switch spots. I now have the permit holder driver in the car, and I have the licensed driver in the, driver, in the passenger seat. The two kids in the back will tell you that the, drive, the passenger turned to the driver and said, let's see how fast we can get my car to go. The two kids in the back seat said, this is a really bad idea. You shouldn't be doing this. Well, they're going to do it. Is there some times in your world at 17, your friends are going to do something, you're not going to talk them out? Is it time for you to leave? And these two 17-year-olds in the back of the car decided to get out of this car. That was the decision they made, and it was a great decision. It was less than a mile up the road. That car crashes in a horrific, absolute, horrendous car crash. Driver's killed on impact. The passenger will never be the same, except the two families were notified that the wrong person lived and died when they got there because they thought the licensed driver was driving the car. Social host law, probably our biggest problem during prom, graduation, Christmas season. So here's what the social host law says. And Nassau County was the first ones to make it a misdemeanor. It is a crime, unclassified misdemeanor. If you are 18 or over and you rent, own, or control a property, that includes grandma's in Florida. Let's go to grandma's house. You now rent, own, or control that property. And someone there is under 21 drinking. You're subject to be arrested under the county social host law. Does that mean as a parent, I can get arrested if they're drinking in my house and I don't know that they were there? We went out for dinner, came back, there's a full-blown party going on. Here's what the law says. If you knew or reasonably should have known that they were drinking in that house, you're subject to arrest. So what does that mean? That means when we interview all these kids, they say, Mr. Groshian, he's a great guy. He set the keg up, he set the bar up, and then they went out for dinner. Mr. Groshian's getting arrested. But if you legitimately had no idea, come back to a full-blown house party, the law says you have to take reasonable corrective action to stop them from drinking. And then it says you have to get them to leave. I got to tell you, I'm not a big fan of having drunk teenagers just wander around to the street. 
You're still responsible. If you need help from the police to get them home, you call the police. If you have the parent's phone number, call the parent's phone number. Having all these drunk teenagers just wander around is a really bad idea. Newsday, uh, not Files 1 anymore, but News 12, they, they, all the police records are public record. They grab it all the time, and there's a wire that they grab these stories from. And on Slow News Day, it's not uncommon for them to run a story on somebody who got arrested for violating the social host law. This couple had a party. They knew they were drinking. Taylor is there at 16. She leaves the house. She's pretty, pretty drunk. She walks over the Northern State Parkway, and she's hit and killed by a car. Another. As I was doing this presentation one, there was a Nassau County police officer sitting here, and at the end, she came up to me. She goes, I just want to tell you a story that happened to me, her family. One of her family members, the kid was having a party in the house, big party. The police got called. They came in. Two kids got hurt. They took the kids to the hospital. Those two families with those kids got hurt sued the homeowner. Their insurance company denied the claim. It's a crime. We don't pay out for crimes. They lost $670,000 in those two lawsuits. This was sent to me by a mom. This is Riley. Uh, the mom and husband go out for, for dinner. These two are sitting down with a pizza and soda. They decide to hit the liquor cabinet. They decide to see what vodka will really do to them. And what vodka do is put this young girl in intensive care for six days. Can you overdose on alcohol? Yes, absolutely. When we talk about drugs, alcohol is a drug. We can overdose on it. Binge drinking. Who gets drunk faster, males or females? Females. You got more water weight. Isn't fair or not, that's the way it goes. Binge drinking for guys is five drinks in two hours. For girls, is four drinks in two hours. Zero tolerance law. This is New York State. They came out with, with zero tolerance. When I see these 0 .02, 0 0.07, that's the blood alcohol level looking for. If you ever see it on TV and it blew into intoxilizer, how many drinks you've had over how many hours. Uh, we, we, we have a very interesting DWI case going on now in Suffolk with that man who ran over that Boy Scout. And they did a thing on him called extrapolation. Nassau County does that too. Yeah, your blood level was a 0.13 when you tested you. But three hours before that, it wasn't. You were much higher. And that's what's happening in Suffolk now. But here we have our, our under 21. 02 to 07 is an administrative hearing. 02 to 07 is administrative hearing. 05, 06, 07 is criminal court. Both fit in both categories. So if the kids get pulled over, and, they, they, and again, when I talk to them, I hope and pray you never drink and drive again and call it someone who has. But this is what the law is telling us. 0 0.05, 0 0.06, 0 0.07 fits both categories. So who decides whether you go into an administrative hearing or criminal court? It's the arresting officer. And I will tell them flat out, a little respect can go a long way here. A little respect can send us into the administrative hearing. I'm not telling you to admit guilt, but yes sir and no sir can help you cause out. Uh, big part of my presentations is social media. Uh, it, it's absolutely incredible how fast social media keeps moving. When we see apps like TikTok come out, you know, the parents all question to me, what apps should I look out for? It's not the apps, it's the rules. The apps keep changing, evolving, moving. It's the rules we have. When they're learning to drive, you don't tell them how to drive a white car or a black car, you teach them the, the rules of driving a car. Same thing with social media. This is from admission counselors, and this is what they're telling our kids before they start applying. Ninth grade, your college track starts. I get in ninth grade, you're not thinking about college, they're thinking about you. And they don't get your whole senior year. Matter of fact, you early action, early decision at college, those kids right now are waiting for their responses. They don't get to see your senior year. This decision is going to be made off your freshman, sophomore, and junior year. So this is what the counselors told the kids, and this is what I have when I do it with them. You are never anonymous. It never disappears. Your posts can always be found. They hide under this privacy thing like they'll be protected all the time. Social media shocker, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook can cost you a scholarship or admission officer. Just because you have that admission letter, just because you have your scholarship doesn't mean they can't take it away. We had it here on Long Island. Most of the schools I deal with, I deal with the guidance counselors. And questions come back, phone calls go back and forth. We have a young man for athletes, National uh, Signing Day. It's the biggest day in an athlete's career. This year it's February 5th. That's the day we're going to decide what college we're going to and if we're getting a full scholarship. And this young man did. 
He's going to John Hopkins on a full lacrosse scholarship. A couple weeks later, he's sitting around a fire in someone's backyard, and they're drinking a couple beers, and he starts saying stuff he should not be saying. And his friends thought it was funny, so they put it up on YouTube. Student body, rightfully so, found it offensive and went to the principal. They felt the principal didn't do enough, so those students sent that link to YouTube to John Hopkins University. And the next thing that young man got was a letter saying, you do not fit the moral character of what we're looking for. They rescinded his scholarship and his admission office. A mission offer. <coughs> yeah, the prom's nice, it's cool, it's great. Just be careful. Watch what you're posting, watch what you're putting out there. Everybody's watching, including the colleges that accepted you. We have our challenges, all of them. Cinnamon challenge, we set ourselves on fire, we drink milk till we puke. And then we came up with the Tide Pod challenge. So I will make sure I tell these seniors not to eat Tide Pods. Uh, this girl from Utah, she thought that uh, she ate the Tide Pod, but she said it wasn't part of the challenge. So my question is, then what did you eat the Tide Pod for? This young lady's at college her first semester. She's not there a month. She goes on Snapchat because we put up Snapchat before and everything disappears. No, it doesn't. Nothing ever disappears. Nothing. There's not an app, a chat room, a video where things disappear. It is always saved, archived, or remembered somewhere. She takes this photo and she writes something really disgusting underneath it, but I'm going to send it out to my friends. That's all I'm going to do. It'll be funny, it'll disappear, and no one will see it. Well, one of her friends didn't think it was so funny, and she screenshots it. When you screenshot a Snapchat, you get notified that it was just screenshotted, and it tells you who screenshotted it. And then that friend sent it to the college tip line. An hour later, she's expelled from that college. This is a guy from the University of Albany because it's very important for them to understand that sometimes you don't have to do anything grossly negligent for the internet to come back and hurt you. This kid did nothing. This is the star lacrosse player from the University of Albany. They're getting ready for the playoffs. He gets a letter from the NCAA. He's suspended indefinitely. Suspended indefinitely? What did I do? He tagged a stick string company on his Instagram account that the NCAA didn't get paid from, so they suspended him. His coach said, no warning, no nothing, just in an instant, you're ineligible to prove an innocent. Anyone see the movie October Sky? Right? This is about a, a uh, mining town in West Virginia. And the guy wants his two sons to be miners, and one of them, Homer Hickman, wants to go and build rockets and work for NASA. And that's what the movie's based on. I wish this girl would have seen this movie. This young lady gets into the NASA internship program. One of the most prestigious, hardest to get into programs that she gets in. This is how she's going to express to the whole world her joy at getting this internship. Not exactly the way you should be expressing yourself. So she's going to get a warning from Homer Hickman. Homer Hickman's going to tell her language. You better watch what you're doing. You better watch what you're saying. Everyone's watching this, especially NASA. Be careful. She didn't know who he was. What she should have done, and if I'm talking to a high school audience, what you should do is Google. I wonder who Homer Hickman is. That's not what she did. I only show this slide to seniors and adults. No one, uh, no one underneath them sees it. This is her reply. She tells him to, and then she found out who Homer Hickman is. He's on the National Space Council that oversees NASA. That's what she just told to stick it. You know, it's funny, but it's not funny. These young kids, they have so much stress and pressure. You watch them working in a high school. They go on Naviance. Everyone here knows what Naviance is. And they, they, there's four schools they should get into. And they get a rejection letter. What'd you get that rejection letter from? It has to be something online, because you know from Naviance that from last year, you were guaranteed to get into this college. Watch what you're doing. Watch what you're posting. But his friends thought it was funny, so they hashtagged the conversation. Funny things about hashtag. They are never private. They are always public. When you hashtag something, it goes public immediately. Hashtag NASA. She deletes the tweet. I got news for you. Nothing ever gets deleted. Nothing ever gets removed. Nothing ever gets erased. And NASA withdrew their offer. When this all breaks, when this all, they go to Homer Hickman, they say, why'd you tell on her? Because I didn't tell anybody. I didn't say a word. This was a young lady who didn't understand the power of social media and the internet. I didn't tell anybody. How did NASA find out? Our friends hashtag the conversation. NASA sets up Google alerts on all incoming interns. 
when they hashtag it, NASA gets the alert. They read it. So in essence, who got this taken away from her? A friend. Or she did by what she did, but her friends did by hashtagging it. Are you responsible for your friends also on YouTube and on Snapchat and on? Yes. Be careful what you're posting. <clears throat> this is uh, an actual horror story. Last year, this incoming year, Harvard got the most uh, applications they've ever got. They accepted less than 5%, which is way below the norm. We have 10 young people who get accepted into, Na into NASA, into Harvard. They're in. That, that acceptance letter's hanging on a refrigerator. Mom and dad are telling everybody. And then these 10 decide to go into a private Facebook chat room. Very unusual that they would use Facebook. But it's private. Who's going to see it? And they said, the stuff that they said, I can't even put up here. It's horrible what they said back and forth to each other. But it's private. Who's going to see it? Harvard saw it. They all got letters. That, that, their, their admissions got rescinded. So I'll tell these seniors, I just want you to think about how that went at the dinner table that night. How'd that conversation go between you and mom and dad? Let them know that you're no longer welcome into Harvard. It's not just athletes. This is the NCAA's March, March Madness. We get Southern Mississippi State. There's a bit of a Cinderella team in the Sweet 16, which means we, besides having the ratings go through the roof, they even go higher when we get that underdog team in there. And this young man, Mr. Rodriguez from Puerto Rico, is getting ready to take a free throw, a foul shot. And he lines up on the foul line, and the camera pans from behind him to under the basket, where the Southern Mississippi University pep band is. And they start chanting, where is your green card? Where is your green card? A couple things that college students should have thought about. He's from Puerto Rico. He doesn't need a green card. <laughs> the other thing they should have thought about, if my team is in the NCAAs, especially the Sweet 16, there is a good chance that my college president is either at this game or watching it. And she was. And she was mortified. But this is a smart woman. She didn't expel any of them. What'd she do? She took their scholarships. She took the scholarship from each and every one of them. And I, and I told the seniors, I wonder how that phone call went when you find out you don't have the money anymore. I don't know, did the, did the county cops go into synthetic marijuana at all? This is just a little, I'm, I'm just going to graze over it because vaping's becoming huge. But here, here we got uh, today's article, Marijuana Vaping Bust and Rise, 502 years. That's from this morning. But we did get two Long Island teenagers hospitalized. One went into a coma over vaping the THC. Our kids aren't just vaping vapes anymore. It's funny because we're going to attack the flavors. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's the drugs they're putting in there and not so much the flavors. The problem when, when you vape THC, a couple things happen. It's almost pure THC you're taking in. It's almost 100%. And the other thing, that's, it's not regulated by anybody. This is what we found on kids in Floral Park. It's being sold, packaged, right at our kids. These are vaping devices. Did you go into the devices? OK, I'll pass that. Uh, Ben's, this is a website. This is called. Uh, uh, drugsforum.com, and our, they're going to teach our kids how to take any drug, any pill, and dilute it where they can put it into a vape, and they'll be able to smoke it. And it goes step-by-step -step process. And if they make a mistake on one step, what they have to do on the next step to correct it. So it's not just nicotine they're vaping. This is the lethal dose of fentanyl, cough fentanyl, and heroin. Most important law we have ever passed in New York State, and it's not advertised anywhere. Don't run, call 911. This law says that if you think your friend is overdosing, you think your classmate up here is overdosing, can you overdose on alcohol? Yes. If you think they're overdosing and you call 911, and I'll tell them this, and say into that tape line, I think my friend is overdosing, you are now immune from any prosecution for alcohol or drug charges. There's no reason to leave your friend on the ground anymore. Call us, you will not get arrested. Are there exceptions? Of course there are. We walk into what's equivalent to uh, Walter White's meth lab, well then someone's going to jail. But short of that, fentanyl death spiked. And then we have the post, and then we have right here Nassau County, November 6th. So, so when we hear that we're doing all these overdoses are starting to come down a little bit. I have to wonder, when we see all the fentanyl out there, and even the treatment people are telling us that the people they're testing 
are testing positive for fentanyl at an incredibly high rate that they've never seen before. I, I wonder how many people are doing saves at home with their, we've put so much Narcan out there. Fentanyl is, is a drug that's incredibly, you know, very small amount. You overdose, overdose very quickly. Car fentanyl is, is made for big game animals. If you watch Jurassic Park, the first one, they're gonna make a reference to car fentanyl. Signs and symptoms of overdose is very important. They know what to look for, that bluish screen, that breathing that's not really breathing, less than 10 breaths a minute, that's not breathing anymore. That's what Narcan looks like. This is the old one, I don't know how many people ever trained. The old one was a vial, you had to screw it, everyone broke it the first time they did it because they got nervous, but it also was 2% of the drug. The new one is now right into the nose, the whole thing, and it's four milligrams as opposed to two milligrams. Why was it doubled? This is uh, directly because of the fentanyl problem we're having. They had to up the dosage of Narcan. Overdose suspected, not responsible. So you ask them, when is an overdose suspected? Well, if they're laying there and not saying, sorry, not saying anything, if their skin is blue, if they're not breathing, and you know that they took a pill, you know they did something, well, we pretty much know we're, we're overdosing here. The breathing status, normal or fast, we're gonna turn them on their side, less than 10 minutes, we're gonna hit them with Narcan, and not, not, not gasping. That gasping is called a death goggle, and you hear it as soon as you go into a house of somebody that's overdosing. It sounds like a deep snore, but 10 times worse, that, that person's getting ready to go out. Oh, I'm sorry. New York State passed their laws for college campuses, started on SUNY, they expanded it to every, Yes means yes. That means that all sex has to be affirmative consent by both parties. Nobody can be passed out of drunk. That doesn't give you the right to have sex with somebody who's passed out of drunk. This is a, a young girl, her first semester in college. She goes, to, um, goes home, comes home after the Christmas break in January. Her and her, three, her dorm mate and the dorm next, they got, they got along really well, so they all went back a couple early to hang out. Well, to celebrate her and her dorm mate, they split a bottle of champagne, and then they go and they have a couple more drinks. And now they get in the cab and they go downtown to a bar, and as they're getting to the bar, she can't get out. She's having trouble speaking, she's having trouble walking. The high school senior is getting ready for college. Is that woman overdosing? Yes, that's the start of an overdose. As they get to the bar, the bouncer says, she's not coming in here. So they have to carry her back to the cab, and they bring her back to her dorm, and the cab driver actually carries her up and puts her in a beanbag chair. And they take pictures of her and they put it on Instagram because it's going to be funny the next day on how drunk she was. Wasn't that funny when she didn't wake up. She, dried up. she died of alcohol poisoning in that chair that night. 18 drinks in 82 minutes. How do we know? Because it's on the videotape of the frat house. This is 18 drinks in 82 minutes. This is Timothy Piazza from a couple years ago. Uh, after he falls down a flight of stairs, they laugh, they close the door, and they leave him down there, and that's where he dies at the bottom of the stairs. District attorney comes in, and they lock up 10 kids right off the bat. What's funny is when you get arrested like this, and the police take your cell phones, they're looking for that text messages back and forth. Who knew what? Why don't you call somebody? So one kid says, uh, he texts his girlfriend, drink case and can send me to jail. I don't want to go to jail for this. I think we're after. I think you're after too. You should have called some 911. You don't have to be a best friend to help somebody out. 18 drinks in 82 minutes is a little excessive. So they all do get arrested. Four of them get sentenced. And what do we have next? Penn State again this month. These are four college hazings last month where we lost teens again. 17, 18, and 19 years old. I don't know why it all hit at one time, but Penn State hits again. It was a 17-year-old. 21 SUNY sergeants at Plattsburgh, Texas State, LSU. This kid's blood alcohol level was 0 .49, 0 0.08. He's driving while intoxicated. This kid's blood alcohol level was 0.495. They charged the kids. They're arrested on, ha on hazing. And then you're going to see the parents. Another one at Ohio University. This is the trial that's going on now for that LSU death. It's happening now. This was the testimony from the one kid. They were yelling at him. They handed him a 190 proof bottle of alcohol and they forced him to, to guzzle it. You know, part of this with the kids, you have the right to say no and to leave. You don't have to do this. You don't have to let people do this to you. I don't care what frat or sorority it is. Don't change who you are over this. 
Ohio fraternity pledge said he felt like he was going to die after hazing ritual and fired the spike paddle. Why would you ever let anyone hit you with a spike paddle? This is from the Post. But it's not just alcohol. We, we always have these things of hazing. We're going to make people drink. Sometimes it's stuff that they think is funny that really no one should have got hurt at. Like, like the, the four pledges, they had lock arms to, to, to cross a little creek. They've done it over and over again. It's only knee high. All they had to do was get to the other side. There was a storm the night before, and that creek picked up a lot of power. So when the four of them hit the creek, it swept them off their feet, and all four drowned. That's hazing also. The young man in the desert in California with no, no water and a backpack littered down with rocks, and he dies of dehydration. That's hazing. The two young ladies who are rushing for a sorority, and they're, they're forced to stay up for 72 hours, and they do it. And then they, then they let them drive home, and they crash and kill themselves. That's also hazing. <clears throat> Big part of my presentation with the kids is getting prepared for this first year of college. Getting prepared for the sexual assaults that take place. And the stats are absolutely unbelievable on what's going on in the college campuses in the first two years. That's why the first two years it goes to the red zone. Did you cover this, Teresa? So 84, 84 who get assaulted get assaulted in their first two years. But even more important, 90% know who did it to them. And they still won't come forward because they think it's their fault because they got, they, they got drunk or they got high. It's not your fault. You're allowed to come forward. 62% of are drug facilitated on college campuses. Can that include alcohol? Yes. Yes means yes law, that's it. We did that already. Title IX, as you do your college walkthroughs and you do your orientations, you're going to see stickers that say, watch your nine. You should know what that means. That Title IX is very important. The Cleary Act is very important. The Cleary Act and Title IX together cover everything from discrimination to harassment, violence, sexual assault in both categories, domestic violence and criminal offense, but it also gives you a set of rules that the college has to provide for you. A, they have to make the college atmosphere safe. B, you're entitled to have a person come with you to these hearings. You're entitled to counseling by the college. Association of Recovery of Higher Education, if we have someone who has an addiction and they want to go away to school, it's very traumatic for them. This organization, you tell them what treatment you're in, they'll find colleges that will match you to your treatment so you can still go away, have the college experience, and keep your treatment up. Andrew Sadik. Andrew Sadik's a young man. He's out in the Midwest at college, and he gets set up. He gets set up on a drug buy of marijuana. It wasn't a lot. It was three grams. We're not talking a, a, a whole lot. But a lot of these colleges and towns got together, and they decided to make any drug sale at all as a felony if it's on college campus. Sounds like a good idea. It's really not. So Andrew gets arrested for this felony drug charge for a little bit of marijuana. And, and the interview, the video, the detectives, everything's done on video. It's a 40-minute interrogation. And they threaten him with 40 years in prison. This is a kid who's never been in trouble before. This is a kid who really doesn't know what to do. So they said, or you can become a confidential informant. And you can set up 10 people the way you just got set up. But you can't call your parents and you can't call a lawyer. On his third drug buy, he shot and killed. When they go through these stories, they find out that it's not just Andrew. There's a host of our young people becoming confidential informants. They're not drug dealers. So here's my thing for them. I want a lawyer and call your parents. No one should ever threaten you with 40 years in prison for, for a, a possession of marijuana. No one should ever do that. I want a lawyer and call your parents. Or more for cooperating. Doing it with a lawyer there. These are all fraternities that have been shut down over the course of the last year. Uh, Swarthmore College, upstate New York, just, just no more sororities or fraternities at all. They're done. They don't want the problems anymore. No more. This is Baruch. What happens here, as everyone gets charged, they killed this kid, Michael Deng, and they did kill him. As the tr trial comes to pass, as they're being tried, the prosecutor brings up not one person out of 37 picked up a telephone and called an ambulance. Not one. You have the right to say no. You have the right to leave. You have the right to refuse. You have the right to call your parents. 
whether it's at a prom, a party, or your way at college. When I was uh, working, I worked midnights for nine years, and I was the senior guy. That meant I got to do the desk and stay inside and keep warm while everyone else was out. And, and what happens one night, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen. It's such a strange world. The 911 line rings. It has a very distinct ring, and I pick it up. The, one, the woman on the other end says, I need help. I need help. So something wrong with my daughter. I recognize the voice. It's my neighbor. I said, I got you. I got, I got an ambulance coming to your house. Tell me what's going on. No, no, not here. Not here. She's at college. I need help. Well, the whole story was this. This is a middle of a blizzard from, from Long Island to upstate New York. An absolute blizzard. Covered everything. Wind, freezing cold, snow everywhere. Her daughter is rushing for a sorority. As they leave, she falls on ice and she cracks her head. She goes immediately unconscious. What her friends do right away is call 911. What good friends? They didn't run, they didn't hide it, they called 911, they got help. You know, when you go to these SUNY schools that are all spread out through New York, they don't all have trauma centers. So the ambulance comes in the middle of this blizzard, they drive her to the nearest community hospital, and the first thing they said, she needs a trauma center. Albany University Medical Center is the nearest one. Normally they would fly there. Can't fly because of the weather. So now they're going to drive her there in this ambulance through the storm. But my neighbor, of course, gets in the car to go up there. The car has no gas. That's the way things work in life. She goes to the gas station, fills the car, come out, the car won't start. She was calling us to jumpstart her car so she could get up and go see her daughter. And everything worked out fine. But it worked out fine because her friends had the guts to call 911 right away and get the help that young girl needed. And one of the biggest mistakes our kids make, you only live once. Nope, you live every day. You only die once. And we see that over and over and over again. I'm going to get into the dark web real quick. I know you guys have been here a long time. If you want to go, I don't get insulted. I was a cop for 32 years. Uh, there's three parts of the web. The surface web, that's what we use all the time. That's our Google searches. Then there's the deep web, and that's where we're going to do our online transactions, our banking. It is secure, it is encrypted, but it has a purpose. Law firms use it, hospitals use it, insurance companies use it. It's a nice way to send things back and forth. It's pretty encrypted. And then the bottom of this is the dark web, and that's where we get the bad stuff, the really bad stuff. So you read these articles, the dark web's not really that bad. Yes, it is. Nothing good goes on the dark web. If it was for good, it'd be on the deep web. <clears throat> Tor. To get on the dark web, I need an Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer isn't going to work. Tor is the, the way to do it. There's, there's a lot of them, but Tor is the, the most common of them all. So if you see Tor, that's somebody heading to the dark web. That's what they're going to use. used to be very complicated. Now it's very easy to get on. Why use the dark web? Well, Tor guarantees that everything's going to be secure and encrypted back and forth. How does it do it? When I send my information out, it bounces my IP address a minimum of three times before it gets to the other person. And when they answer me back, it bounces their IP address three times before it comes back to me. So I'm going to get an IP address. It's not the person's computer. They're going to get one from me. It's not my computer. They're also going to ask you now to download PGP on the dark web. Anyone here familiar, anyone here familiar with PGP? It's pretty good privacy. It's a text messaging, secure, encrypted app. It's another layer of protection for them because some police departments, FBI's, and prosecutors are getting, starting to get pretty good at tracking some of the transactions on the dock. It's still very hard, but they're getting better at it. So once we add PGP, it's another layer of encryption, almost impossible to get through. And that's how we're going to talk. You're going to see a dot .onion. Anything that has a dot, not dot .com, not dot .gov, not dot .org, Dot, dot, ed. If it says dot .onion, that's a dark web site you're on. What's on the dark web? This is the armory. This is known as the Walmart of gun sales on the dark web. More important, if you look at the top, it is a dot .onion site. These transactions are almost impossible to track. What do they use to pay for it? We're going to use cryptocurrency. Right now, Litecoin, Litecoin seems to be the way to pay for things. Extremely hard. They're going to break these guns down. They're going to send them in pieces so it doesn't look like anything like a gun, and you'll be able to assemble it with, with directions when it gets back to your house. Oh, this is Peter Scully. This is a 60-minute story. If you ever watch something really disgusting, it's a pretty good story to watch. I wouldn't eat before I watched this guy. He, uh, it's funny. I was in. Anybody here from Port Washington? 
I was in Port Washington, and a kid raised his hand in front of an auditorium and asked me what a red room was. I said, I'm not talking about it, but that creates a problem for the school. Because now every kid heard the term red room, they're going to go look for it. So what do I do? I dump it right on the social worker. This is now your problem. <laughs> so I was surprised that a middle school student knew what a red room was, but we didn't bring it up. But I will tell you what it is. Red rooms are, th this guy in particular had women in captivity out in Asia. And he was using the dark web and webcams to transmit back and forth and to accept payments. The problem is when you're using dark web, no one can catch up to where you are or what you're doing. Um, his ultimate downfall was a video of an 18-month-old baby, and that's when everyone started getting serious and went after him. But he was doing this for six years pretty much untouched. And, and you would go sign on, you'd pay him, and then live in real time, he would do things to women in a cage that you would tell him to do on the webcam. Some of these girls were 18 months, three years old, five years old. Uh, this is Chloe. Chloe is a professional model. That's what she does. Chloe's agent gets a contract sent to her house, a real contract to do a photo shoot in Italy. The, the address they give her is a studio, and the payment was attached. She goes to Italy, she's standing out front, she gets kidnapped. She gets kidnapped and she's taken to a place called Turin, T-U-R-I-N, Italy, in the mountains. And those two guys tried to sell her on the dark web. And that's basically the 60-minute dark web presentation in about five minutes. If anyone has any questions, I'm here. Thank you for your time and thank you for staying. I appreciate it.